Next, Leonard Susskind talks about his disagreements with physicist Stephen Hawking regarding the nature of black holes. The two scientists, along with a third from Holland, have argued about the topic for over two decades. Professor Susskind spoke with K.C. Cole of USC's Annenberg School of Journalism at an event hosted by the Los Angeles Public Library. This program lasts about an hour. Hi. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, I guess people are interested in black holes. One of the things I wanted to say at, at the, the outset was that it, it's important to realize that this book is about a lot more than black holes or a war over a specific issue. Um, I think few people realize just how exciting physics is right now. Um, peak revolutions are in store about the way we think about space, time, and matter, very fundamental things. We know this because there are big cracks in understanding places where things just don't fit, where the large-scale laws of the universe, Einstein's general relativity, the idea that gravity is the curvature of space-time rather than a force, a very well-proven theory, um, your GPS satellites wouldn't work <laughs> if they didn't take That's into right. account, uh, very well-proven. This. Uh, this is a very smooth landscape. On the other hand, we know that quantum mechanics is also true. This is a jittery, uncertain landscape um, behind all electronic devices as well as the existence of atoms. But these two theories, when they get together, they conflict and produce disastrous results. This book looks through a very specific lens at a very profound mystery that illuminates the place where this crack is and things that are happening. I think that's one of the reasons it's, it's so interesting. Unfortunately, among the ideas that you kind of have to get used to, and you do it very well and slowly with lots of um, help, are ideas that are entirely counterintuitive to us, not just quantum mechanics and curved space-time, but also holographic universes, also string theory in multiple dimensions. And so I wanted to start by asking, how, how are people supposed to grasp ideas that are so nonsensical and counterintuitive? Right. Well, before I begin with that very hard question, <laughs> I, I, I simply physically cannot begin a thing without, like this without saying good morning, class. <laughs> good morning. Thank you. Physics is very, very strange. Reality is very, very strange. It's very, very different than we understand through the, through the mental architecture that our brains were created with. Uh, I think it's a matter of evolution, basic evolution, that the architecture that we were created with, the neural networks and so forth, are good, very, very good for understanding certain kinds of aspects of physics. Force. Force is something very easy to understand. I give you a push, you understand force. Mass, well, what is mass? Mass is just the resistance to force. You try to push a locomotive, it's a lot harder than trying to push a ping pong ball. So we have this really visceral understanding. The word uh, that Heinlein used to, under, to talk about that kind of visceral understanding was to grok something. We grok, the number five, we grok. Uh, the orbits of stones when we throw them into the air. But as I said in the book, our standard issue grokker simply overheats and breaks down when we try to understand things which are way, way beyond what evolution uh, created for us. So, for example, the special theory of relativity had to do with velocities which are so close to the speed of light that uh, all sorts of new things happen and a human being who had never moved faster than, uh, what, I don't know, 10 miles an hour before the 20th century, I don't know, maybe that's not quite right, before the 19th century anyway, uh, nobody had ever moved faster than 10 miles an hour. Nature didn't give us the machinery necessary to understand those things. Uh, quantum mechanics, the strange motion of electrons and so forth, who would have needed that? I mean, you would have to be, a, as I said in the book again, you would have had to come from a very, very strange family to have grown up uh, with the ideas of quantum mechanics as part of your uh, basic intuitive understanding of the world. So we were not born with the machinery that enabled us to grok the basic concepts of physics that materialized at the beginning of the 20th century. 
when all of the parameters of physics moved into extremely distant and extremely remote ranges. What did we do? We did mathematics. We created the mathematics which would allow us to manipulate and to understand these things without being able to really visualize them. Let me give you an example. Uh, the world is four-dimensional. Einstein taught us that the world is four-dimensional. String theory tells us that the world is ten-dimensional. Close your eyes and try to visualize even four dimensions. Uh, how many people can do that, can actually see? You can see four. How about five? Okay, he, he's one. You must come from a very strange family. <laughs> you have your way of doing it. Okay, you can do it. But uh, I can't. I cannot see more than three dimensions. As a matter of fact, you might think you can see two dimensions. Can you close your eyes and see two dimensions? Sure, it's easy. You see a surface. But if you think about it, you're always seeing that surface embedded in three dimensions. You can't get away from the three dimensions. You can't see the surface without the three dimensions. Try to see a line. Every time I try to see a line, I either see it on a paper or I see it in three dimensions, and I can't get away from it. There's a reason for this. Your mental architecture was simply not created to be able to visualize things in any number of, in, in any other dimension. So now that we've basically given everyone permission not to grok necessarily right. what we're talking about, um, let's... Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that was a disclaimer. That was the, it's okay to be confused. In fact, it's good to be confused if you want to do science. Um, I did want to ask you why you wrote this book. You, you quote Churchill in the introduction, history will be kind to me for I intend to write it. And then you go on to talk about the war with right. Stephen Hawking. So. That was, uh, of course that was a joke. Yes. <laughs> but uh, why did I write this book? Look, this was the most exciting scientific. I've been involved in more than one scientific controversy. No. I've enjoyed them all. Uh, this one was bigger for me and uh, more profound. I had always felt as a young physicist that I had wished that I had been around when quantum mechanics was invented or the general theory of relativity. All the stuff that came after it seemed to be outgrowths of it. It wasn't until these kind of questions came up that I really thought we were potentially in a situation where we could do the kinds of things that our intellectual ancestors had done, create entirely new ideas. And uh, when this was over, I said, I want to talk about this. I want to explain this to people. It, uh, it is uh, something that, uh, that uh, I lived through, that physics lived through, that, uh, and uh, that is big. It's big. And, uh, so why did quantum mechanics need to be saved? Ah. <laughs> Why did quantum mechanics? It wasn't so much that quantum mechanics needed to be saved. We had two apparently contradictory theories of nature. Two apparently contradictory theories. And at one level, it was simply curiosity. Mm -hmm. How do these things fit together? How do you manage to fit these things together? A lot of physicists are just driven by curiosity. Of course, some of them are driven by winning a Nobel Prize. Okay, let them win their Nobel Prize. I'm basically driven by curiosity, and most of my friends are. We had these two quite contradictory or apparently contradictory views of nature that didn't seem to mesh properly, that seemed to give rise to mathematical inconsistencies. Mm -hmm. Stephen Hawking was the one who put his finger right on where the mathematical inconsistency was. And uh, uh, that, uh, that needed to be reconciled. You can't live with two contradictory theories of nature. Some place, something has to give. So let's go into detail. And so I have to say I'm a little bit disappointed, as I told you, that um, it turns out Stephen was wrong, because I always liked the idea that, <laughs> that you could account for the missing odd socks in the laundry because <laughs> they were caught in the remnants of black holes. But apparently, right. at least the information about the odd socks can be retrieved. Um, <laughs> Without the smell, the, I don't, the, never mind. The question, yeah, exactly. So the question that you were basically concerned with with information loss, throw this yeah. book into a fire, it yeah. burns, you have soot, yeah. particles, light, photons, you can theoretically put it back together again. Right. But it appeared as though in black holes this was not the case and information could be hopelessly scrambled, not just locked up in the black hole, but actually destroyed. Destroyed, yeah. Not just locked up and not just scrambled, but destroyed. Yeah, one, 
maybe the most fundamental principle of physics. I've come to believe that the most fundamental principle of physics is that bits of information can't be destroyed. What is a bit? Uh, a bit, if you reduce um, all of our conversation here to Morse code, then the bit is the dot and the dash, basically. Your computer is full of bits. They're encoded on a silicon wafer and so forth by electrons in certain places. But your computer is full of bits, little yes-no questions. And they move around and they circulate and they answer questions and so forth. But you can't get rid of a bit. There's no way to get rid of a bit. Now you say, wait a minute, I can erase uh, some, uh, some file from my computer and that erased file is lost. Where is it? I can't get it back. Well, what's happened to it? Every time you try to erase a little bit of information, you create a little bit of heat in the environment. And that heat is just those little bits going off and circulating throughout the atmosphere, getting scrambled up among the atmosphere, getting hopelessly scrambled. You can't recover them easily, but they're there. They're there. You can't get rid of bits. That is probably, to my mind, the most fundamental principle of physics that... Uh, now, what's... Explain why it was that when Stephen Hawking discovered right. that, in fact, in fact, black holes are not that black, but they do evap evaporate, they do radiate, and eventually right. evaporate. Why this really changed things and created a crisis? Yeah, uh, well, okay, there were, two, there were two ways to think about it that weren't the crisis. One way that would not have led to crisis, had Stephen said it this way. Had he just said, before he discovered his radiation... Had he just said information is lost inside black holes because they fall, because the bits fall into the black hole and they're lost, nobody can get them out, I think we might have just said, okay, but we can do the bookkeeping by just saying the bits are inside the black hole. Huh? They're just, they're, we can't get them out. They're in a lockbox. And that was popular for a while, yeah. right? And that was popular, yeah, yeah. sure, sure. They're just in there. You can't get them out, but they're in there. When he discovered that black holes evaporate, the bits, uh, where were they? When they were the magic, you know, like the magician who, uh, well, you can imagine what the magician can do. He puts something in his hat and then shows you the hat and it's not there. You put something into the black hole, the black hole evaporates, where is the bit? Well, one possible answer, which I think we now know is probably, is, is the right answer. Some may disagree with me, uh, but they're wrong. <laughs> um, yes, those little bits come flying out with the radiation that comes out of the, then it's called Hawking radiation. Why didn't Stephen say it that way? And the reason is because he understood another picture of a black hole, and he understood it very, very well. Uh, the way I like to describe it is the horizon of a black hole is a point of no return. Uh, shall I explain that? Yeah, I just wonder, okay, does good. anybody not know what a black hole is? Good, okay. <laughs> yes, you do, Gwen. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> it's a very condensed piece of material. It's so condensed that its gravity is so strong that nothing can escape from it, including a light beam. Okay, that's hard for me to wrap my brain <laughs> Well, that's because you weren't provided with Darwinian circuits to, uh, rock to rock it. it. But right. you can understand it. Now, remind me what the question is. I'm having a senior moment. The, the question is, it, because Stephen apparently did, did yeah. not phrase the problem in the sense of of how the evapor right. how the radiation that was evaporating, right. how the information was lost that was lost that way. Right. He was looking at a different right. way to look at black holes. Right. All right, so let me explain a little bit about black holes before we try to do that. Uh, give you a image of a black hole, a pictorial grokking of a black hole, which which may help. Um, the way I like to think about it, in fact, I learned this from one of the great pioneers of black hole physics, Bill Unruh. But uh, it's his water picture of a black hole. I think maybe the best example is Niagara Falls. Here you are, you're rowing your boat up above the falls. All right, you're rowing happily, no problems at all. But there's a point of no return. And that point of no return is where the water is moving faster than you can row. As long as you're on the good side, you can row away from the falls. If you get on the bad side by accident, you're doomed. You're not dead. You may not even notice. In fact, you would have no reason to notice that you crossed the point of no return. Nothing happens there. I mean, you don't get bumped. You don't, uh, nothing terrible happens to you. But you're doomed anyway. You're not dead, but you'll be dead. Okay? <laughs> as soon as you hit the rocks. As soon as you hit the rocks. 
All right, now to translate. The water is space, and space and time. The point of no return is the horizon of the black hole. Once you pass the, uh, the horizon of a black hole, you can't outrow it, you can't outrow the current, and the current is the flow of space-time. You can't outrow it, no matter how hard you row. And not only can't you outrow it, a light beam can't outrow it. And so you can't even send messages out once you've crossed the horizon of the black hole. But nothing special happens at the horizon. The, the dangerous thing is when you hit not the waterfall or not the rocks below, but the singularity of the black hole at the center. So that was a very, very common picture of the horizon of a black hole, that it's simply a point of no return, but in itself not dangerous. Right? There was another not picture. Very, with not very many features. With essentially no features, right. right. No hair, as, like, uh, like me, as John Wheeler <laughs> said. Right. Uh, there was another picture of a black hole that grew out of the work of Jacob Beckenstein. Mm -hmm. And I'll just briefly tell you what it was. It was that the idea that all the information that ever falls onto a black hole is stored at the horizon in the form of a soup of bits. Let's call it a soup of bits, uh, a um, two-dimensional or almost two-dimensional sheet of very hot, exceedingly hot uh, gas of bits that are rapidly vibrating, doing very complicated things over a very thin shell, and that's the horizon. Now that's the picture that came out of quantum mechanics. The picture that came out of general relativity is that it was just a point of no return. And these are obviously inconsistent. I mean, we're, we're always doing things to poor Alice. I don't know why we pick on Alice. Oh. Alice and Bob. Alice and Bob are phys the physicist's favorite two uh, punching bags. Mm -hmm. Alice is always thrown into black holes while Bob stands on the outside and watches. So consider poor Alice who tumbles accidentally into a black hole. According to one picture of the black hole, she just, and, and take this to be an extremely big black hole, much bigger than uh, is likely in, in our world. Very, very big. Alice falls through the horizon and nothing special happens to her. She just sails happily through, cool as a cucumber. That's the picture that general relativity and that's the picture that uh, that's Alice's picture of it, or at least the general relativity would say. The picture that quantum mechanics says is that Alice gets heated, fried, baked, evaporated, ionized and turned into elementary particles and scrambled, completely scrambled and radiated back out in the form of Hawking radiation with the Hawking radiation carrying off the bits. That's what quantum mechanics demanded be the... Uh, be the uh, so right. there's the big contradiction. Right. It sure sounds like a contradiction. How can both be true? How can Alice both be killed at the horizon and sail cleanly through? Now, your solution... <laughs> M makes use of a lot of very complicated concepts. One of them, which we talked about years ago, was the idea of holography, that on this two-dimensional horizon could be encoded enough bits, all the bits you would need to recreate the entire three-dimensional range of information that went into the black hole. In fact, right. that our universe is probably a big hologram, which is encoded on some lower dimensional surface. Right. Okay, well, let me go back to the black hole for a second, and then, and then I'll get to that. No, 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 I, 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 no, no, you're asking the right we're question. We're to the hard part yet. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're to the hard part. Uh, we're, we're to the, the hardest I can deal with anyway. Um, right, the question was, which one of these two stories is right? right? And I'll come to your question in a minute. Which one of these two questions? And the answer is, both are right. Both are right. And our understanding of it, ultimately became something like this. Now I'm using analogies and I'm using metaphors and of course metaphors at some level are always slightly wrong but this is close. This is closely correct. The world, not to forget the world for a minute, the black hole horizon. The black hole horizon is a kind of hologram. Now uh, people have seen holograms I assume. They're three-dimensional images but they're three-dimensional images that are cast by a two-dimensional film. The information, the full information about the three-dimensional world is stored on a two-dimensional film. 
it's all coated on the two-dimensional film, but if you look through a microscope at that two-dimensional film, all you would see would be a scrambled bunch of nonsense, not, not anything you could easily decode. On the other hand, decode the hologram, which means shine some light on it, but just think of it as a decoding process, reconstructs a three-dimensional reality. Right. Huh? The horizon of the black hole is like a hologram. It's like the film of the hologram. It's a very, very scrambled version of what's on the interior. So we learned from thinking about black holes that both were true. There were two pictures. There was the hologram, the meaning the film right. on the boundary, which was keeping faithful record of everything that fell in with a one-to-one -one correspondence between them. That's the thinking now. That, uh, but once you admitted it for a black hole, you were forced to admit that the whole world is, in a sense, a hologram. Because, as a matter of fact, we don't know that we're not in a black hole now. A big enough, if there was a big enough shell of matter collapsing around us with the speed of light, we couldn't see it. We couldn't see it because light wouldn't have time to get to us from it. We might be inside a black hole now. So if we are in a black, uh, inside a black hole, that means everything is being recorded on the surface of the black hole. So basically the solution came down to, an, in a sense, another one of these dualities yeah. that is all over physics. Yes. Light is a wave, light is a particle. You can think of a black hole as something you just go into and you're lost forever like Alice, or you can look at it from the outside, in which case all the information is encoded mm -hmm. on this right. two-dimensional right. surface. But you did not really have the mathematical underpinnings for this until there were That's, some yeah. developments in... Here we go. Yeah. String theory. Yeah. I'm yeah. going. Okay. You're always one step ahead of me. <laughs> Excuse sure. me. One step ahead That's of me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. It was just one tiny step ahead of me. I just want to say that a lot of time and effort was spent trying to see if we could deduce a contradiction from the idea that both of these things were true. In particular, one physicist who I think you know very well illuminated it greatly. By adding, uh, by adding to, uh, to um, thinking about contradictions. It was John Preskill who, uh, who unraveled a number of the paradoxes. And the ultimate conclusion was that there was no contradiction in saying both were true. But now let's go. Uh, you, you asked me, did I have the mathematics to be able to nail this? And nail it means make it so convincing, so mathematically convincing that uh, the rest of my colleagues, let us say, you realize that at first the idea of a holographic universe was considered slightly mad. I mean, you know, everybody knew Susskind's a good physicist, but he's lost his marbles. Uh, what was it that nailed it in place? And it was the mathematics of string theory. It was the mathematics of string theory, particularly in the hands of Juan Maldacena, who at that time was a young, uh, he wasn't a student anymore, he was a... Uh, uh, I think he was a faculty member at Harvard at the time, but quite young, and Ed Witten, who realized that, uh, that the string theory contained exactly this kind of uh, thing in it. Duality. This kind of duality and this kind of holographic description Where of a... a lower-dimensional universe right. was equivalent to exactly. a higher-dimensional universe, right. one with gravity, one without. Right. The two one scrambled, equivalent. one unscrambled. Right. And they found... Exceed, and it wasn't just them, I mean, it was a whole development that took place, but they found in an extremely sharp mathematical way that that was true in string theory. Now, that didn't mean string theory is correct, but, uh, but what it did mean is that there was a way out of the paradox. Right. But does that mean that physicists who aren't string theorists are people who don't necessarily buy into what string theory is telling us would accept this proof as as strong as the string theory community Well, does. I think by now the answer is mostly yes, mm -hmm. they do buy into it. Uh, let's put it this way. The relativists, the people who concentrated on the general theory, the people, right. and they were, the, they were more in line with Hawking's feelings about it, uh, they were very hard to convince. I couldn't convince them. It was the mathematics of string theory. They realized, oh boy, there's something, there, they... They have to deal with this, and uh, there was no room. There was no room for wiggling anymore. They were trapped by the arguments. So um, I think most of them do. Now, that doesn't mean to say that there aren't a few people mm -hmm. who still resist. There are. 
Well, through a lot of this, uh, I, I have to point out, I wasn't quite sure where I was going to do this. It's very funny to hear Lenny give sink analogies and water analogies, because <laughs> you were at one point a plumber, Indeed. correct? And um, I actually wanted to ask you about how that affected the, the way you the way you do physics, the way you think about things, and how did that transition take place? I don't, I don't really place? know, but let me say about being a plumber, I want to explain to you what being a plumber was. My plumber, when he comes to Palo, in, in Palo Alto, dresses better than me when I lecture at Stanford. So I was a plumber in the South Bronx in the days when it was a tough business boy. But anyway, <laughs> okay, so what did it mainly do for me? It mainly convinced me that I didn't want to be a plumber. <laughs> There's got to be something better than this. Yeah, but otherwise, no carryover. I don't know. Yeah, it's an in interesting ways, question. Be, I don't because, know. Because, you know, it's interesting to think about. As you point out, our, our resources, in a way, are so limited. In a way, a lot of the book is as much about what we don't know as about what we do know and about what the mysteries are. And, and we wind up thinking, well, maybe we're just at the beginning. Maybe yeah, we just are getting the, the, a glimpse of what's out there. Um, so... I think it's interesting often for people to think, especially theorists, where your your tools are really your mind and a pencil and paper or chalkboard. How, how do you do and that? Your colleagues. And your and colleagues. Your co and the ideas well, of your colleagues. That's very important. Yeah. Maybe you can explain that a little. How that process works, how you actually play with images and equations in order to come to insights well, about the real, the yeah. real world. Um, the interesting thing for me is the enormous diversity of the ways that people think. Uh, my friend Ed Witten thinks entirely differently than I do. Stephen has this incredible pictorial way to think about physics, which I share to some extent, but I'm sure that his ability to visualize things go way, way transcends my own. Visualize things pictorially. Uh, some people think just algebraically. They think about manipulating symbols and pushing them around. And, there's a, and I would say for every really good physicist I know, they have their own special way of thinking. And I think what makes the thing go, uh, my own opinion is no individual could have concocted modern physics. That it was this enormous diversity of different ways of looking at things and somehow being able to communicate the, those different visions which, uh, which allowed physics to go ahead. I don't think any single way of thinking about things would have, uh, would have sufficed. So, oh, okay, so what I, the only thing I wanted to say is that the exchange of ideas and the continuous exchange of ideas is absolutely central to our field. Right. So the, the connection I was going to make was merely something we talked about before, that when you talk about your war with Stephen Hawking, it, it's a collegial war, it's, yes. a, it's a disagreement whose goal is to find out what's true, yeah. as well as to win, maybe. But, right. the, but the main goal is to get to the truth. Right. It's, um, yeah. not I, I don't think of us as Macbeth and uh, Macduff. I think of us as, uh, as Richard and Saladin. <laughs> we respected each other. We admired each other. I would even go further than that. I would say we loved each other in a way. But we had different principles, which not moral principles. I don't know what Stephen's moral principles are, and I barely know my own. But I know that we had different physics principles that we trusted. He trusted a kind of um, classical conservative view of space-time. I trusted, a cl uh, not a classical, but I trusted a conservative view of quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. And so we clashed, and we clashed intellectually, and his daughter describes it as Shakespearean. <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing was very Shakespearean. But as you know, a lot of people take disagreement among scientists to mean that they don't know what they're talking about. Oh. They very much misunderstand no, what no, that's these how, that's how that's how knowledge uh, develops, uh, through, uh, through conflict and through clash of, uh, clash of minds, clash of principles. And incidentally, let us assume for the sake of argument uh, that we all agree that I'm right and Stephen's wrong. Well, Stephen, even Stephen, St well, st well, let's not worry about what, this, what Stephen believes now. Let's assume that I'm right. Uh, <laughs> uh, the question is, did Stephen make a mistake? I don't, I don't see it that way. I see it entirely differently. I see it as Stephen asking one of the great questions of physics that, uh, that led to deep new insight and um, to say that simply that he made a mistake and got the wrong answer, that is completely wrong. 
he had the vision, the insight, and the profundity to see that there was a very, very profound question that needed answering. That's the way I see it. Yeah. Not that he made a mistake. That, uh, that's, a, that's, a trivia, that's a trivialization of it. Well, and, and before we go to questions, which I think, although I don't see Louise, we're about five or ten minutes. Okay. The, the way you wrote this book, because I have no idea, really, we, neither of us do what level our audience is at and what basic questions we're not bothering to answer. But this book does not shy away from using equations. And, in fact, you, you say that everybody told you, I've heard this many times before, that you lose 10,000 readers for every equation you put into a book. <laughs> this book has both. It has lots of everyday analogies, but it also has a lot of equations. It's no, a very a difficult... No, no, wait, wait, not a lot. I, 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 I figured I figure it most... 20, uh, a couple dozen, maybe? No, I think maybe a dozen. Yeah, okay. I think maybe a anyway, dozen. Anyway, it, it doesn't... It doesn't condescend. It doesn't look down to the no. general public. Obviously, your view of the of the what the general public is interested in and wants to read in physics is is pretty high. Well, what I felt, I got to certain mm -hmm. points where I knew I could explain things without the equations, and I did. Mm -hmm. uh, I think everything is explained yeah. without the equations, but I felt there were arguments of such beauty. For example, Bekenstein's argument about the entropy of black holes that I thought was so beautiful and so elegant that it would be a sad dumbing down not to present it to those who could uh, uh, deal right. with the equations. Right. I tried very hard, nevertheless, to explain without, uh, to explain in a way that those who didn't follow equations would be able to, fix, uh, to follow. Yeah, well, that's, uh, I, I think that, that makes most people feel very, very good about what they're reading because one of the frustrations with a lot of science journalism is it's so shallow that you really don't have any information. So um, I'm, I'm glad that you, that you went that way. L let me then, since we have a few more minutes, talk about one more aspect of this book which is, which is charming and, and also interesting is that you are kind of the lone, the Ahab out there. <laughs> um, nobody's really taking this problem as seriously. Um, you, 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 you're just obsessed with solving it, and you're having a little bit of a hard time getting your colleagues to, one, come along yeah. to your yeah. point of view, and two, even bother yeah. to take it but seriously. But you know, in many ways, I wasn't thinking about my colleagues. I was obsessed with convincing Stephen. I, you know, I saw and still see Stephen as a great physicist. Mm -hmm. I thought he had put his finger on an absolutely marvelous question, and I thought it was much deeper than he himself realized. And there were times when I wanted to shake him and grab him by the neck and say, Stephen, don't you understand that the thing that you've asked, the thing that you've said here, is monumental. It's much bigger than just the question of whether uh, a bit may get lost behind the horizon. His attitude and many of the people's attitudes is, oh, ho-hum, information is lost behind horizons. My attitude was, in order to bring these two theories together, which were in such conflict, and make it not be that information was lost, and that we would learn something really, really profound, and I just wanted Stephen to see that. So I was very much obsessed with convincing him. Okay, so it was basically about him, because often you yeah, talk about more. frustration. Oh yeah, no, I had frustrations with my colleagues too, I wanted to punch them too, and I... And, uh, but, but <laughs> a loving kind of punch. Right, right. But, uh, You're all uh, still friends. I think we are, I, oh, I think yes. like to know what the, um, what the audience is thinking and what kind of questions there are out there. We've roamed over a lot of, lot of different kinds of questions at a lot of different levels, and um, I'm not quite sure where the confusions are. <laughs> um, okay. Um, the woman, yes, right there in the edge. Thank you. One thing about the horizon that makes us just that that's the point at which the, the 2D uh, image of the, uh, of the hologram gets, gets put into place. Yeah. Okay. It, uh, even in classical general relativity, before we even had quantum mechanics, it was quite well known that somebody standing outside a horizon, standing outside the black hole, would see matter fall onto the horizon and sort of get stuck just at the horizon. Th this was a question of clocks and time and, uh, and so forth. 
from outside the black hole, and this was absolutely standard uh, general relativity, if you watch something from the outside fall onto a horizon, it never quite makes it. It just, mm -hmm. I think Kip Thorne described it though once as a sort of sedimentary process where all the layers just slowly, asymptotically get closer and closer to the horizon, never quite getting there. So even in classical general relativity, if you watch from the outside, nothing ever goes through the horizon. So it was natural that when you were trying to keep track of the bits of information that you would assume that they were stored on the boundary on the, at the horizon. Uh, in fact, that's what the horizon was. It was the place where everything slows down and just comes to rest as seen from the outside. But then what was discovered is that stuff just coming to rest wasn't really coming to rest, but it was incredibly thermal and hot. So it was a combination of general relativity and quantum mechanics, but the answer to your question is uh, that the horizon was the place where everything slows down and just comes to rest, even in classical uh, physics. I don't know, does that help? Yeah, good. that was a good question and a good answer. Yeah, it's a very good the question. Microphone? Um, how about this gentleman Um, I'm, I, I, I think I know what you're saying, but I want to <laughs> reaffirm it, I guess. Okay. Uh, I, I think that the, the major conclusion that you're talking about, that you're, coming out, uh, uh, that you're coming out with with your book, is about a different view of the universe being holographic. That there's yes. a yeah. imprintation of what's going on around us, yeah. our, our entire existence, that's on a different dimensional plane than we are aware yeah. of. Yeah. And, uh, am I correct? Is that the... Yeah, I, I think that is certainly one of the dominant lessons that, uh, that uh, uh, the mathematical precise description of the world that we understand that we know now uh, appears to be on a two-dimensional surface far away. Okay. Let me follow that up with, if, if the two-dimensional surface in terms of the black hole is the horizon, what is the two-dimensional surface in terms of the universe? Any, ah, good. That's, okay, that's one of the very curious things. Uh, if you were to take this room and ask about everything that happens in this room, I would say the mathematical description of everything that happens on this room should be in, in terms of a number of degrees of freedom, a number of bits of information that are just the number that it would take to wallpaper this room densely with one bit of information per Planck area, whatever the Planck area means. Smallest pixel. That would be this room. So it would say that the hologram is on the walls of this room. Then they go out to the walls of the room and look for the hologram. You're like Alice falling through the black hole. You won't see them if you try to walk through them. But you'll say, okay, let's take a bigger region. Yes, that same bigger region, if you want to study the physics of that bigger region, will be in terms of a yet a bigger hologram. So the hologram is never there when you go and look for it. It's like Alice looking for the bits at the, uh, at the surface of the horizon. And yet, the mathematical description of everything in this room can be given in terms of a holographic description on the walls of the room. Does that help? <laughs> it helps a little. Yeah. It helps a little. But the, for the universe, the two-dimensional surface would be what? Ah, the horizon. The horizon of the, the horizon. universe. The horizon, the cosmic horizon. Hori the cosmic, the cosmic horizon. horizon. Okay, as far back right. as we can see in space and time. As far as we can see, right. Okay, let me go somewhere else. Uh, this woman in the front. Oh, am I making you run? I just wanted to get to this side of the room. Then I'll come back to the middle. Hi, thank you. If, um, if this mathematics of string theory is what convinced you on your proposition, what is sustaining Stephen Hawking's position, or does he, when he looks at the string theory mathematics, or is he agreeing, disagreeing, or just taking a totally different view and ignoring the mathematics? Oh, well, of course, I, Stephen should talk for himself, speak for himself, but as I understand it, well, it's not as I understand it. Stephen and I are good friends. We had dinner about two weeks ago together in his house. Uh, as I understand his view, his view is that he was wrong and that I was right. Now, no, that's, that is his view now, that, uh, that he finally was forced into such a tight corner, not by me, but by the string theorists, 
that he eventually conceded. And, uh, but at no point was, uh, was he being foolish. At every point, he had very convincing arguments. But the weight of argument eventually got so heavy in favor of uh, the holographic point of view that he said, OK, I was wrong. Stephen is a man who is very capable of saying I'm wrong oh, and, yes. uh, and loving it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Especially when he wins. Um, well, no, he, lo he, he doesn't mind losing bets. Losing. I don't know if he In this uh, case, it wasn't much. Uh, uh, baseball encyclopedia. Baseball encyclopedia. Yeah. And, and I think, and, and one pound to Don Page. Yes. <laughs> right. One uh, British pound, not a pound of flesh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would have been more difficult. Shakespearean, um, as I so said. Let's take uh, that person over there in the corner, and then we'll go to the middle. I think he's right behind you, actually. Thank you. Hi. Um, so you mentioned this mental framework, and you talked a bit about the idea of uh, kind of our mental capacities evolving over time and that allowing us to understand newer ideas. Um, my question, I hope this makes sense, but do you think that science sort of drives, or it's sort of science is a result of like historical and uh, dialectical... Sorry, um, that science what? That science is a result of, of history, or that science kind of drives history and drives the intellectual world into new spheres? Well, well, first of all, I don't think that we evolved the ability to understand or grok quantum mechanics. We didn't. My mind cannot uh, deal with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. I doubt that, uh, that minds will ever evolve. By, by evolve, I mean by Darwinian selection. Mm -hmm. We evolved the ability to do mathematics. Now, you're asking me a question which I am fascinated by and don't know the answer to, and I think it's a wonderful question. What was it about uh, the evolution of human beings that turned them in, that made them curious, mm -hmm. that made them curious about the world, and that gave them the ability to do these abstractions? It certainly wasn't that they had to do physics. Physics has only been around for 300 years. Evolution didn't uh, take place over 300 years. What was it in the evolution of a human being that created this ability to abstract? I think it's a marvelous question, and I have no idea what the answer is. And it may be an accidental consequence of something else. It could be an well, accidental yeah. consequence. Usually what so, happens is accidental consequences get used. Exactly. Yeah, they, uh, they fill some niche, and then the species makes use of them. Yeah. And, uh, so I, I don't know. I'd, uh, I'd love to ask my friend. Uh, I'd love to ask Dawkins or somebody yeah, what they think about it. In that sense, is like a telescope or a microscope that allows us to see things that yeah. otherwise we are brains right. in their natural state cannot see. Yeah, okay. but we do something that it would seem would have no particular evolutionary benefit, mm -hmm. namely think about the universe, right. namely think about elementary particles. You can't even get girls thinking about elementary <laughs> particles, so I don't think it helps <laughs> procreate the, well, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> well, that was a sexist uh, thing to say, wasn't no, it? No, 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 it's perfectly okay. Um, all right, we'll go to the middle. There were a couple of questions. The gentleman in the blue shirt for a long time, and then... I appreciate very much your um, your modesty in t talking about the uh, inability to picture some of these uh, complex relationships, which uh, makes me feel a lot better and perhaps yeah. other people in the audience. I'm very interested in the fact that mathematics seems to be the final arbiter of truth in maybe a lot of science, but certainly in your area. And I'm just wondering if the, the structure of equations and theory, the way they've been built up over the centuries, really justifies putting so much faith in mathematical equations. Gee. Um, <laughs> duh. <laughs> oh, come on. Do you want me to answer, give a small answer first? <laughs> Go ahead. I don't know any other way to do it. That's yeah. all I can say. When I have to visualize six dimensions, I can either sit there and try to see it, or I can add three more letters to the alphabet and push them around using equations. The only way I know how to do it, and the only way I can do it, is by using equations. I would love to be able to visualize or even to be able to express everything without the equations, uh, but I don't know how to do that. 
Uh, as I said, I think we're limited in our ability to visualize and uh, to grok things, and so mathematics is a crutch. Mathematics is a crutch that we use when visualization and intuitive understanding fails. Well, That's about all I can say about it. Well, you describe it also as a distillation of those... It's, it's a distillation, exactly. It it's puts a it into a simpler language that then yeah. can be manipulated. And the surprising yeah. thing is that over and over and over again, things that have popped out of equations, like an errant minus sign that turned out to be Absolutely. an indication of antimatter, but this has happened over and over again, turned out, we've gone looking for it, and it's there. So that math isn't something that, that's separate, it's just a way of thinking, it's another language. Well, I, I guess the question is, why couldn't you have seen that minus sign without math? Why couldn't you have just visualized the phenomena and seen uh, the phenomena? And World is seen, too uh, messy. It's just Does that too, answer it's your question? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think so. show, those imperfections occasionally show up that would yes. make you a little bit dubious of parts of mathematics. Or at least parts of the application of the mathematics to the physics, yes. Right. I mean, at any given stage, we always hope that there are going to be imperfections because it's the imperfections right. which by recognizing them that lead us on to, to better theories. Mm -hmm. So the imperfections are right. extremely important in that sense. Uh, Okay, let's go over. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. You know there was a gentleman right there. Oh, he had his hand up before. I'm debating between two questions. <laughs> but the first question that was asked you raised in my own mind. Is the term horizon the best choice to explain whatever it is explaining? Excuse me for being... Yeah. Oh, it's no, no. I, um, I think it is a good choice. It's... And sometimes, of course, it was bro borrowed from the horizon of the Earth. Uh, you look at the Earth and there's so much you can see and there's the amount that's over the horizon. And, in fact, uh, you, can't, uh, you can't see more than that. And you can move around, but you'll never see over the horizon. The horizon will sort of move mm -hmm. with you. But uh, whether it's the best term or not... It's the term that history has uh, has um, imposed on us. So, uh, terminology which may not seem so terribly appropriate has a way of catching on, and you simply use it. Uh, I, I don't know what to say. It, it, Did you have a reason for thinking that it's a bad term? Yeah, that's a question. Do you think it's a bad term? I, I don't know enough to comment on that. Yeah. Perhaps you could well, explain just help me understand at least who first used the term I don't know I don't know is uh, anybody here know who first used the term horizon in a black hole I know who first had the idea that the horizon is a point of no return and I well I say I know John I say I maybe? no 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 I don't think it was John I think it was David Finkelstein oh. I think it was David Finkelstein uh, who first uh, understood that the horizon was something which mm -hmm. when you fall through it light can't mm -hmm. escape from it uh, somebody might correct me, but uh, mm -hmm. but I don't know who the first person to use the term was. I don't know. Okay, now we have this ge and this woman. Uh, yeah, why don't you give it to him first? Thank you. I told that, I told that string theory has not been demonstrated yet. You're telling yeah. me that string theory or the mathematics of string theory. I'm not sure is necessary to connect to cosmology and astronomy. Never said it, never said it, never said it. I did not say that. Let me tell you what That's the present state... One could prove the other. No, no. Uh, let me say what the present state of play is, in particular with regard to black holes. The present state of play is certain arguments were made, which were very, very convincing arguments, that quantum mechanics and gravity could not fit together that inevitably, no matter what you did, quantum mechanics and gravity would not fit together because black holes would do something that was inconsistent with quantum mechanics. Now, string theory is a mathematical theory. It's a highly consistent, nobody doubts its, own, its internal consistency, mathematical internal consistency, having nothing to do with whether it's a theory of the real world. 
It's a mathematically internal consistent theory that has quantum mechanics in it and that has gravity and in which we can prove that black holes don't lose information. So this doesn't say that string theory is the correct theory of the universe. It says that those people who said that quantum mechanics would inevitably be wrong were wrong. That's the state of play now that has been a useful tool in demonstrating a point of principle that those people who thought, in particular Stephen, who thought that black holes would automatically lose information had to be wrong. Because we have a theory, right or wrong for nature, it's internally mathematically consistent and it does something different than what Stephen said. So that now uh, um, diffuses, if you like, the inevitability of Stephen's conclusion. Whether, whether string theory is the right theory of nature has not been demonstrated. That is correct. And I, I would say probably most string theorists would say that you're only at the beginning of understanding it, although the tools have been phenomenally successful. Yeah. The tool, oh, yes. As tools of math, uh, the mathematical tools that grew out of string theory have been fantastically successful in a wide variety of different circumstances. Um, it may be, I don't know how long it will take to really nail it and say this is the right theory of nature. Yeah. Well, there are uh, experiments going on. The woman in the yeah. green had a question. Uh, quick comment and a quick question. My comment first is that Hindus for millennia have been saying that... Say it again. Hindus for millennia Hindus. have been saying that this world is an illusion and the only reality is enlightenment, but that everything that we see, that we shouldn't become attached to this world because it's an illusion. So you could say that your theory explains that you know, spiritual principle really well. Yeah, <laughs> okay. So. My, my, my only comment is that um, it is not my theory anymore. This is a, a part of uh, physics now, so I don't want to say it is my theory. Yeah. So yeah, all, all the, the Hindus is, are feeling that. They now have a yeah, scientific principle yeah, that yeah, can attach to their spirituality. Yeah, right. My question is, right. the, when, when you talk about black holes, and physicists talk about black holes, you said, you said uh, earlier about something would have to be very big. So, so my question is, are, are black holes in general very small, or are they very big? And are they everywhere, or are they nowhere? Yeah, and, <laughs> well, and which evaporate uh, both, might good. Be, yeah. black holes are both very big and very small in what sense are they very big well the only black holes that we know about in nature and we do know about black holes astronomical black holes and there's no, there's no debate about whether they're out there uh, those black holes are in a certain sense very big they're the consequence of the collapse of stars so that means in terms of mass they weigh as much as perhaps 10 stars or something like that. So in that sense, they're very big, the ones which are actually out there. On the other hand, they're also very small. You take that much mass that was in a sun, a star, and you squeeze it down to something very small. Well, not microscopically small, but maybe a kilometer. If the Earth could be compressed, a giant vice would compress the Earth to the point where it would become a black hole, it would become as big as a blueberry that's how big. So it, they're both very big and very small. Very heavy, but very condensed. Uh, it's imaginable that you could collide particles together with enormous energies and create black holes by particle collisions, and you could create small black holes. You could create small black holes which were no more heavy than a dust moat. Uh, how big would they be? Very, very small. A lot smaller than a proton, for example. On the other hand, you can also imagine black holes forming at the, uh, they do form at the center of galaxies where they're very, very much bigger than uh, uh, solar system size, I forget, this. 300 million solar masses. The yeah, 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 so that's, uh, that's uh, 300, uh, so that's roughly 300 million. 300 so I think million, we have yeah, time kilometers. for about two more questions. Take this gentleman here and then. I, okay, I promise, you're next. <laughs> <laughs> He's next. <laughs> you talked about the view outside the horizon, and how everything the view from from outside the horizon from outside yeah. the horizon, and how everything comes up to it, 
and becomes thermally energized. Yes. Now, I don't exactly know how to phrase this, and I'm not sure even if I do, that there's an answer. What's the view like, if it's at all possible to conceive this idea, inside the black hole? Okay. Um, when we're talking about being inside the black hole, you can't stand still inside the black hole. The gravity is so strong inside the black hole that it warps space so badly near you that you just have no choice but to flow along with the flow and in a very short amount of time, depending on the size of the black hole, you're going to be swept into the singularity. So you can't stand still and watch things. But in the process of falling through, uh, uh, through the horizon, you look around you, you see nothing unusual. You can look out. You can see the people on the outside. They're waving to you. You, can't wave. you can wave back, but they won't see you. So the, the view from inside the black hole is absolutely ordinary, at least until you get close to the singularity. It's the same as the view of the person in the rowboat passing the point of no return. They see nothing special when they pass the point of no return, not until they go over the edge of the falls. It's exactly the same. Mm -hmm. uh, or if you're falling in an elevator, nothing. Well, that's another example. You hit the yeah. Ground. Yeah. yeah, but there there's no horizon. Right. Right. <laughs> okay, right. I'm really sorry. This <laughs> has had his hand up since the very beginning. Thank you very much. This has been a fascinating conversation. Um, two quick questions. Is Hawking radiation detectable? And do you have any hopes or expectations for the super collider oh. that is going to be uh, starting up in Europe next year? Yeah. Um, Hawking radiation, we're talking about genuine black holes now. All right. I think Hawking radiation is actually not detectable from, uh, from uh, astronomical black holes. And there are two reasons. The first reason is that the ambient space around the black hole is actually, black holes have a little bit of heat. But how cold are they? How warm are they? They're very, very, have very, very little temperature. The temperature is very, very cold. And the ambient space around them is warmer. And that means the flow of heat is from outside in. They're not evaporating, they're absorbing heat because they're colder than the surroundings. If you waited forever and ever, they're not forever and ever, if you waited until the universe cooled down enough, and it will, it's constantly cooling, eventually it will cool to the point where it will be cooler than the black holes. At that point, the black holes will start to evaporate. But they evaporate incredibly slowly they're very, very slowly. Um, I, I remember computing how long it would take a black hole solar mass to evaporate, and I can't remember if it was 10 to the 60th or 10 to the 70th or something like that, years. Is Kip here? Mm -hmm. But what about the very yeah. small yeah. black holes? Yeah. The smaller they are, the faster they evaporate. Right. So if you had a, and, one and of the these they very are, small the black holes, are. do you think you could see Hawking radiation? Yeah. Yeah. And that those... Yeah. Some people think no. actually might be created. At well, those are sort of analog black holes, mm -hmm. really. Whether you really want to think of them as black holes, uh, they're, they're not conventional black holes. They're analog black holes uh, that, uh, that might be produced in, uh, in high-energy collisions. Well, we have a new accelerator going online in Europe, yeah. the Large Hadron Collider, which is poised to maybe answer some of these questions, maybe well. get... Yeah, some maybe. hints of what might be um, around the corner. Well, at least give some we order. already know that very high energy collisions of nuclei of all things, of all stupid things, collisions of ordinary gold nuclei, mm -hmm. they, and it doesn't have to be gold, yeah. uh, of, of nuclei at very high energies produces something which behaves very, very much like a black hole. Right. But it's a kind of analog black hole. Uh, it's not a genuine, ordinary, real black hole in the same sense uh, of a regular black hole. These things behave very, very similar to black holes, and we've already tested out some of the uh, some of these theories, some of the properties of these collisions, 
behave very, very much like you would expect black mm -hmm. holes to behave. So there's that already is a, some tests. For, for me, that, that was one of the most fascinating parts of the book, actually, is right. the last chapter where right. you talk about that and the connections. It was um, something I hadn't heard about before. Well, and, and it's kind of interesting because when I first contemplated writing this book, I was really torn about it because I didn't want to write something that there was no possibility of ever having experimental detection of. Uh -huh. I nevertheless decided to write the book, and in the time during which the book was being written, these great discoveries about, uh, about string theory mm -hmm. and so forth uh, happened and provided experimental tests for some of the ideas. Yeah. yeah. It's just wonderful. Are right. we done? Or? Yes. Thank you so much. You're Thanks for the audience. It was very fun. Leonard Susskind is a professor of theoretical physics at Stanford University. For more on his work, visit stanford.edu and search his name.